thank you. Thank you very, very much for that lovely warm welcome and thank you all for coming out on this cold evening um, to be here to share this uh, terrific, uh, beautiful uh, venue. I'm absolutely knocked out by it. Thank you, Stephen, for your beautiful music at that, uh, that gorgeous machine. Uh, that organ is absolutely beautiful. Um, thank you to Christina, thank you to Neil, thank you to Amy and Manya and everyone who's put so much work into this. I thought it was really um, quite wonderful that we'd be celebrating the anniversary of the Martin Luther King Symposium with the water theme semester and, of course, the Penny Stamps um, series because it's kind of culture and human rights and ecology all together. And to me, that brings the water story together. And Neil, thank you for your introduction. I once read that uh, after a particularly moving introduction, Winston Churchill said he could hardly wait to hear what he had to say. <laughs> Not that I compare myself, but I do think good introductions should come after in case people think, well, she wasn't that good. I don't know <laughs> what the big deal was. So Christina asked me to give a little bit of a background as to how I got involved in this crazy world of, of water justice. We call ourselves water warriors, and we would love to have new water warriors join us. Um, for me, it started roll back a few decades when we were first fighting, while well, we were fighting uh, for a better or actually to stop the very first of these unregulated free trade agreements, the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, which became NAFTA, which was the basis for the World Trade Organization, which became the basis for the more than 2,600 bilateral trade and investment agreements that are really about unregulated trade, and which I consider to be a real threat to the ecology of our world. I mean, I think that where nobody I know is against trade and nobody I know is even against trade rules, but when they're based on what's good for large corporations solely and when they're based on trying to take down the level of uh, ability that governments have to regulate and protect the environment and the social and, and health needs of their own citizens, then, then, then they're wrong and we need to do better. So we were fighting this Canada-US free trade agreement back in the 80s and NAFTA in the 90s, and I couldn't understand why water was in there as a tradable good because I grew up, like anyone here who lives here, with this, what, what I call the myth of abundance, that there's so much water in the world because I lived in Canada, live in Canada, and couldn't imagine that there would be any reason to place it in as a, a notion of a good or something tradable. Well, lo and behold, we couldn't get water taken out of these trade agreements, and I started to do some research. And I started to find out some things that really distressed me, like um, that we have this ecological crisis unfolding on one hand, on this human rights or this human crisis unfolding on another hand, but people weren't kind of putting together the politics of it, if you will, like the question about who owns water and who has the right to control it. So I started doing some research, which included traveling to places just to be with people who were struggling on the ground. I was part of the um, fight in Bolivia, in Cochabamba, Bolivia, in the late 90s, when the, one of the first water wars in the world broke out. Um, the World Bank told Bolivia, or sp specifically Cochabamba, that if they wanted funding for their water systems, their water services, they had to take a private company, and the World Bank sent them Bechtel, which knew very little about water. At the time, their motto was, we, we pave the planet, which gives you an idea <laughs> why we were upset, right? So this is a very poor country, largely indigenous. And the first thing they did was set up a water subsidiary that tripled the amount of uh, the rate for water uh, payments. And they also even said, we own the water that you catch in the cisterns on your roof. Like, we own all the water. We own the water coming from the sky. We own the water in the ground, not just the water we give to you through the service. And people couldn't afford it, so there was a revolution. Literally, they brought the army out. People were killed. But eventually, the people won. It was led by a, a four-foot-seven mechanic who, um, named Oscar Oliveira, who'd never, uh, a labor leader who'd never left Cochabamba in his life, had lived there all his life, and became an international hero of our movement. Um, and they forced, uh, not only did they force their government to get in, give in and to have Bechtel leave, um, but they also forced the World Bank to back down. And, and Bechtel sued through one of these investment agreements, these bilaterals. They set up a subsidiary in Holland, in the Netherlands, because the Netherlands had a bilateral agreement with Bolivia, and they turned around and they sued the government of Bolivia 
Bolivia for millions of dollars of lost um, uh, investment. And we put up such a fuss around the world that they, they won their case but settled for a dollar because, you know, you don't want this to be out there. So this is very exciting. And uh, Bolivia went on to elect Evo Morales, um, a cocoa farmer, um, uh, turned politician, and he kicked the rest of the water companies out and, and um, has set up a, a public system. I went to um, a place called Orange Farm, one of the uh, townships in, in Johannesburg, South Africa, in the uh, uh, Rio Plus 10, the UN uh, um, meeting on uh, sustainable development in 2002. And I went to see what they had done with these, again, private water companies. This one is Suez, and it had put in pipes with taps uh, up to every kind of group, uh, group of, um, well, I was going to say homes, but really hovels. And you've got to try to imagine garbage and burning garbage and, and rats in the, in, the, in the gutter and kids with no shoes and no running water anywhere. But suddenly, this miraculous pipe bringing water. But between the pipe and the tap was a state-of-the-art water meter. And the only way you could get water was to uh, take a, a key and pay to have it charged electronically and then you would touch the water meter and of course every drop you use was was charged and I, I stood there with one activist in the community who said it gives new meaning to the uh, old saying water water everywhere and not a drop to drink because of course nobody could afford it he said I can afford about one flush a month so they take their buckets and they walk to the to the rivers that have cholera warning signs on them, and that's why all of the diseases that we thought were eradicated in the 60s and 70s are coming back. I remember going to, uh, to the World Social Forum in uh, India a few years later and went to a struggle to support a struggle in a place called Plachamada. It's in, in Kerala, in the south of India, and this is one of the many places that Coca-Cola had set up a uh, great big factory slash fortress. You have to try to imagine now, gold, water in many places has become gold, which is why I call it blue gold. And in this site, like so many others, there are big iron gates around the factories and or the factory and, and armed guards and dogs. And I mean, it's really heavily fortified. And so the people there held a big um, conference, an outdoor conference, an outdoor celebration of public water. And uh, the women there had held a silent vi vig uh, vigil every single morning for three years right across from the plant. And I sat for several days with the women from little babies to women in their 90s. Never said a word, never were angry at the people going in, just had a silent vigil. But it becomes so moving in India that eventually it went all the way to uh, the very high level court and the government. They brought scientists in and so on. Um, and a few years later, uh, India uh, forced Coca-Cola to shut that plant. Now, that was a lovely success story, but only one, as a matter of fact, because um, Coke is still in India. But these travels started to tell me and teach me that there was something very important about water, that we were witnessing the creation of a, what I consider to be the greatest ecological and human threat of our time. And so I started to put together with a bunch of people a movement, um, wrote some books, wrote a report first that morphed into a book that morphed into another book. And then we started building networks to fight the privatization, to fight the pollution, um, to fight government lack of services and so on. And um, we have connected ourselves up um, pretty, pretty well electronically. I mean, I'm quite excited about how we found each other and, and, and what we're able to do to support. And it's very much the northern groups um, showing solidarity with the global south and not coming in and, you know, digging wells. It's not that kind of thing. It's, um, it's really about the sovereign right of local peoples to ha have, ra have water and have their own water. But I wanted to tell you that because um, sometimes I think, and this is particularly for some of the students in the audience, you think, well, you know, what can one person do? How can anybody make a difference? And as you know, Margaret Mead said, the only thing that really ever has made a difference are small groups of citizens or people just getting together and, and, and determining that they're going to do something. And together, this band of water warriors around the world really has made some profound differences. And I, I want to start off with a, a hopeful note. Um, but there are some not so hopeful things to also say. So I just want to give you some of the stats and some of what we're dealing with in terms of the reality. There are two crises. There is the ecological crisis and the human rights crisis. 
In terms of the ecological crisis, what we learned back in about grade six, all of us, was that there cannot be a, 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 any way that the earth can run out of water, that the, there's a hydrologic cycle, there's a finite amount of water, it goes around and around in the, in the cycle, and it can't go anywhere. And not only is it the same amount of water, it's the same, same water that was here at the creation of the planet, true to an extent. But what our teachers didn't know and what we know now is that we're able to pollute and divert uh, and displace that water from where we can access it to where we can no longer access it. We're polluting surface water and even groundwater in amazing ways in, in, in parts of the world. Uh, we're pumping groundwater so quickly that many parts of the world are running out. Groundwater is becoming depleted and incredibly um, uh, uh, rapid rate. There's a very new study, an international study that's been done using researchers from around the world but coordinated by one of the UN agencies that, that said that if the groundwater around the Great Lakes is being pumped as fast as the groundwater globally, the Great Lakes will be bone dry in 80 years. I could not make that up. Uh, and then we have moving water from aquifers and rivers and so on to uh, grow crops in deserts where we really should not be um, growing crops. And then, of course, there's virtual water and virtual water trade, which is where you, you, you use water to grow something, particularly an intensive water, a water intensive crop, and then you export it away from, uh, from your from watershed and even the country. Uh, we also bring massive amounts of water into large cities, and if those large cities are anywhere near the ocean, we tend to dump the water as waste into the ocean. And another new study is telling us that about 25% of the rise in oceans is not due to climate, it is due rather from, uh, due to the land-based water being moved this way into, into oceans. Um, and so on. There are just so many ways in which we are taking water from where we can access it and um, changing, uh, changing the nature of the, the environment. And we are creating massive deserts because, of course, when you remove water from the soil in this way, when the sun hits the, the soil, it, does, it, it cannot grow vegetation. The, the water dries up. Similarly, of course, if we remove the vegetation, we lose that cycle as well, and you remove the rain, you remove the forest from a rainforest, and you remove the rain as well. So it's this combination of sun, water, and vegetation that um, moder moder moderates the planet and keeps it cool. Um, so we know that we're running out in a, in a number of places, and when, when you read about it, you'll read about it as drought, but drought's actually, I think, the, the wrong word. We really are running out. Um, Places like Australia, although you know you've been watching the floods, that doesn't negate the fact that um, they are overusing the water stock that they have, particularly in the Murray Darling. 22 countries in Africa, in fact, a recent UN study says that um, about one in three people in Africa now don't have access to clean water within 10 to 15 years, unless something major changes, it will be one in two. So we're going exactly the wrong direction. Um, all around the Mediterranean is a crisis. All, every country of the Middle East is due to uh, run out of water at some point in the fairly near future. China, which has used its water um, as a, a, to, to drive its economic engine, is removing water from watersheds to the extent that 4,000 cities, villages, towns um, are, are potentially going to have to be moved or evacuated because desert is, 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 is encroaching. They use all their water to make toys and running shoes and so on to export. India, they're hitting the bottom of the water table in many, many parts of India, particularly Mumbai um, is a crisis. Uh, Mexico City is sinking on itself. They've taken all the water from underneath Mexico and it's literally physically sinking. It's called subsidence. Uh, again, two more studies to tell you about. One recently that 80% of the world's major rivers are in serious trouble, affecting negatively affecting 5 billion people, which is the majority of the people on the planet. And the one that you really need to let sink into your head, and this is a study that just came out, again, UN and World Bank uh, organized, but paid for uh, by a bunch of water intensive industries, including some of the big bottled water companies. And they found that by 2030, the demand in our world for water is going to outstrip supply by 40%. Now that may sound just like a number when you hear it, but if you stop and understand what we're dealing with here, we're dealing with incredible suffering and we're dealing with incredible loss of life and loss of species, not just our own. 
This, of course, then leads to the human crisis that, that we're also dealing with. And as I say, tend to, tends to be on a separate plane in terms of people's heads, which is part of what we're trying to do with our movement, is make one movement of this and not have them separate. Um, and that is, of course, that water, dirty water is killing people. Uh, lack of access to clean water is the biggest killer of small children in our world. In the global south, every three and a half seconds, a child dies of waterborne disease in our world. I mean, just think, three and a half seconds. Um, and it's, bigger, it's a bigger threat, it's a bigger killer of children than HIV, AIDS, war, and accidents put together. And again, all of the reports that we have coming in from the UN and other places tell us that this isn't getting better because it's, no matter how much money you plow into pumping new water, if you're destroying the water source at the same time, which is why we have to put the ecological and human right issue together, you just can't catch, you can't catch the story. Important to know, though, that this is not just in the global south. We're now beginning to see poor communities in the global north being denied water. And some of you may be surprised to know that in Detroit, a few years ago, they cut the water off to 42,000 residences because people could not afford water. Um, some people who are working in these communities in Detroit tell us that the numbers are probably closer to 75, 80, or even 90,000 people or, or residences that have been cut off. And looking kind of like the townships in South Africa, people are having to haul water in or take hoses from somebody's house and share water with somebody else. So this notion that it's far away is not one that we should make an assumption about. We really are going to see as, as water becomes more scarce and the prices go up, this issue is going to, to grow. So not consequently, of course, there are now contested areas. Water is becoming an area of, of deep um, contestation. It's going to um, be an area of, of, of dissension unless we find ways um, to avoid it. One of them is this, this split between the needs of these massive growing cities and rural communities, indigenous communities, places where people grow food. Uh, when the big cities need the water, they come and take it. Mexico City has confiscated the water of an indigenous tribe in, in Mexico, about 100 uh, kilometers, so what's that, I'm trying to do miles, about 60 miles um, outside of Mexico City. This, they, they took the water source, built a great big armed fortress around it so that the people can't get into it and have just confiscated this water. And this is a story that's unfolding in places around the world. We're also beginning to see nation states beginning to think about the day they run out of water and, and finding sources now in other places, and it's kind of a form of new colonialism. There exists right now in Africa alone uh, uh, private areas of water that, and land and water, of course, that have been bought up by either countries, and in this case, often India and China, because they know they're running out of food to feed their, or water to grow food to feed their people, um, or big investor investment firms. And they have bought up land double the size of the United Kingdom in Africa alone. And this is just a whole new geopolitical shift that's happening. It's called land grabs and you can read about it, but when you read about a land grab, it's usually also a water grab. Countries are worrying about this. China is taking the water from Tibet, which supplies all the water to all the massive rivers that supply the rest of, uh, of Asia, and they're diverting this water through a series of pipelines and dams, and um, there are people who are very concerned about a future conflict between India and China over this um, water diversion. So, and then of course, there's the whole rich poor issue. If you're wealthy in certain countries, you can have all the water you want for your golf courses and your, to wash your cars and whatever you want. And if you're poor, of course, you cannot. Um, again, I remember being in South Africa in that township I was talking to you about and right across a river that had cholera warning signs on it was the place, the economic center of South Africa where they held the actual summit. And it was to get to the, the, the summit on sustainable development, you had to go through great big De Beers 
ads, you know, De Beers diamonds, but they were, instead of diamonds are forever, it would have a teardrop or a water drop and it would say water is forever. And it was just like, like the money in these five star hotels and these gorgeous sumptuous restaurants and so on juxtaposed to this place where half a million people were living in such incredible poverty. The story of course gets played out with water like everything else, but water of course is a life and death issue. So what's the story here? Well, the story in the United States is quite serious. And again, if you live near the Great Lakes, it's pretty hard to kind of fathom this in any serious way. But the US Geological Survey says that at least 36 states and perhaps more will face severe, serious to severe drought within the next decade to two decades. The National Re Research Defense Council has just done a major report on water and they found that a third of all the counties in the lower 48 face high risk of uh, shortages by 2030. 400 are at extreme risk and they noted 14 states, they said, will uh, their supply will exceed, their, sorry, their demand will exceed supply um, within the next 20 to 40 years. Uh, I don't need to tell you probably about the South and the Southwest. I mean, this, the Ogallala Aquifer, which supplies water for the breadbasket of the West, um, is only supplying water for about half the food that it grew uh, in 1970. I mean, the water is being depleted so quickly. Got to try to imagine what we're talking about with groundwater depletion. We're talking about bore wells, that a technology that didn't exist all that long ago that are that go as deep into the ground as skyscrapers go into the sky. I mean, a couple of years ago, uh, they, there, were, there was groundwater pumping so severe one summer, it was the three summers ago, that the United States Geological Survey reported that they were actually reversing the flow of water in Lake Michigan that instead of pumping groundwater that was feeding Lake Michigan, they were pulling down uh, Lake Michigan water. So this is happening. There are 200,000 uh, bore wells around the Ogallala Aquifer pumping 24-7 um, nonstop. Um, the uh, Lake Mead, which was the man-made lake that was made um, when the, the created when the Hoover Dam was was uh, built, um, is has maybe 10 years, 10, 11 years of life left unless they come up with some way to to replenish it. Um, and uh, Florida has something like a thousand some people moving into the state every day. Um, they have deplenished, uh, depleted uh, um, their water. I call it water mining, their groundwater so much that they've got big sinkholes opening up and whole houses and so on are falling in. It's a guy named Stephen Chu. He's a Nobel laureate and a director for the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And he says of the, of the water, potential water crisis in the United States, he says this, there's a two thirds chance that there will be a disaster. And that's my best scenario. So I say to myself, how come and I can give you similar stats for Canada. If you think that we're home free, honestly, we're not. <laughs> many, many, many crises that we have in our country too, in spite of the fact that we do have more water than many countries and fewer people, but we are ruining our water as quickly as we possibly can. We're in a race to, <laughs> with anybody to um, destroy it. So believe me, I'm not here saying you guys are, are doing this and, and we're so wonderful, not at all. Um, but what we, you know, I look at these stats and I say, why is the issue of water never raised in elections in North America? Why does it not come up? It is, I find it stunning. And I think the reason is that we have this myth of abundance, that we just can't imagine a time when this might happen here. Maybe it happens somewhere else, but it won't happen here. We also have the notion in our industrialized modern world, our first world, that technology will fix anything that goes wrong. So what the heck, you know, you'll build desal plants. Well, desal plants are phenomenally expensive. They're energy intensive and they put a poison brine back out into the ocean. They are so not the answer, you know. Well, we'll recycle. Yes, of course we have to recycle, but if we allow the world's water sources to become polluted and then allow the recycling and cleaning up of it to become its own business, then I worry about whether we're going to ever bring in the kind of laws to protect source water in the first place. I really worry about this notion that water, as one investment analyst recently said, is going to make buckets and buckets of money because of the water crisis. He gave a, a talk at a, a big investment uh, uh, conference in, in London, England, and buckets and buckets of water. Which I love the image of that, <laughs> of money, I mean, to be made from the water crisis. 
So we have allowed unfettered development in North America, golf courses, swimming pools, mega houses in the desert. Do you know that Arizona is, as we speak, big, building the largest water theme park in the world? They're going to have waves that are so high that you can surf on them, and they're going to have streams and rivers that, that run so fast you're going to be able to whitewater raft on them. We dump our toxins in our sewage in our water systems. More than half of, the country, of this country's industrial municipal wastewater facilities are in violation of the Clean Water Act at any given time. We subsidize wasteful, chemical-driven, water-intensive uh, industrial food production. We use flood irrigation to grow inappropriate crops and deserts. An astonishing 75% of all irrigated land in the U.S. is in the 17 states where the precipitation isn't sufficient to sustain crop rotation. So, I mean, we're, 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 we're allowing these practices, and now we're promoting biofuel production, which is, of course, growing food to feed cars. It takes 1,700 gallons to produce one gallon, uh, sorry, of water to produce one gallon of corn ethanol. And, but, you know, you get in the state of California has planned so much uh, ethanol and, and, and subsidies to, to have farmers uh, grow this, uh, the corn for corn ethanol, uh, that it would take another third of the Colorado River to sustain or to, to, pr to produce this, um, the subs this subsidized biofuel. But it's like the water folks are over here and the ag folks are over here and nobody's um, talking to each other. So, and, and in the United States, like many other parts of the world, uh, we're mining the groundwater relentlessly. Fully half of all domestic water use in the U.S. is pumped from the ground. Um, using technology that didn't exist 50 years ago. And you need to know this. Every single day, a third of this water, this groundwater and the surface water that is pulled up, is sent out of the country, not just out of the watershed, in the form of virtual water. Canada, the United States, Brazil, and Australia are the four biggest virtual water exporters. So massive amounts of water are leaving, particularly parts of the United States with the least water um, to do this. Quite simply, we have made this assumption that water, there's so much water that we can undertake any development we want. We can grow anything with it in any way that we want, any time, any place. Um, and the water will always be there to support that growth. And to perpetuate this myth, we've come up with the notion of drought. You know, well, it's just a drought, and of course, at the end of drought is rain. Um, but we haven't used the words running out, and it's time that we did. What about the Great Lakes? Well, I've just finished a draft of a report on the Great Lakes, so I am filled with Great Lakes. Um, I'm eating, breathing, sleeping, um, thinking the Great Lakes. Ask me anything about any agreement between Canada and the US, when it was signed, and so on. It's fresh in my head. But here's the situation for the Great Lakes. Again, this myth of abundance, this assumption that it could never run out, that we've got all this gorgeous water here and, how, and, and we can do whatever we want with it. There are really two visions for the Great Lakes. I call them dueling visions. And one really does have a rich history of care, really that does, right back to the 1909 Boundary Water Treaties Act, up through a fisheries commission with Canada and the US, up to the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreements and its, its various forms wetlands work that we've done, work to decrease DDT or ban DDT and, and, uh, and PCBs, work on acid rain, uh, work to clean up uh, the, the mess that Lake Erie was in a few years ago. There have been some really good attempts and, some, and there are hundreds, maybe even I would say thousands of groups around the Great Lakes who deeply care and who are doing everything they can to protect the Great Lakes. But the dueling vision for the Great Lakes is this, that it is an economic engine of development and growth and that that's got to be its primary function instead of seeing it as a as a living ecosystem that has to be protected because it could be destroyed and it truly could what we what we're doing is we're we're using we may say it's a commons and we may say we care about it but what really we're doing is allowing massive pollution and massive destruction of the Great Lakes because their primary purpose still I'm afraid, is to make money for the people, some of the people, certainly many of the companies around it. So we continue to allow the worst kinds of industrial production 
around the lakes using heavy chemicals, um, intensive livestock operations and so on, so that it, when it rains, all that stuff just goes directly into the lakes. We continue to allow all sorts of dumping of toxics and toxins, including all sorts of new ones that weren't around when we were back fighting DDT and, and PCBs and so on. Uh, we allowed, we cr created the St. Lawrence Seaway, we dredged, they dredged, I mean, I don't mean we in this room, but they dredged the St. Lawrence so that the big ships could come in, the big ocean-going vessels could come in and ply the lake so that we could have more, we could make more money and have more business. And of course, with them came invasive species, and the invasive species are getting uglier and worse. A new study by the two governments on both sides of the border really, really worried about not only the Asian carp, but this dreaded new thing called the snakehead, which I'm sure some of you who are working on this know about. It makes the Asian carp look mild. Um, but will they stop the ballast dumping? Will they stop these ocean-going vessels? No, because, and Canada in this is worse, I have to tell you. There is some really good work being done in New York State. They're proposing very strong legislation around ballast. Um, protection, um, but Canada is saying, and our government said right out loud, it's it'll it'll hurt trade, and trade is everything. Trade, you know, we are trade is our god, and we we must not do anything that limits trade. So we have a very bad combination of of continued toxic dumping. Um, we have 43 uh, what they call areas of concern, which is a euphemism for toxic contaminated sites that are really seriously. Um, uh, awful. We have invasive species. We have groundwater pumping. We have warming from, um, from climate change. We have over-extraction. There are about two billion gallons a day of water being that's taken out of the lakes that is not put in, put back in. It's about a, a trillion gallons a day taken out of the Great Lakes, but about two a billion gallons of that does not get put back in. So we are, in fact, beginning to deplete the lakes. And Everybody says to me, well, you can never imagine the Great Lakes going. I remind you of this study, and anybody wants that, uh, that um, reference, I, I'm happy to give it to you, that if the groundwater around the Great Lakes is being pumped as fast as the groundwater globally, the Great Lakes could be bone dry, and that's a quote in 80 years. But also, you look to the Aral Sea, it was a lake, it was the fourth largest lake in the world, it was in the former Soviet Union, and they pumped it so hard to grow cotton in the desert that they basically destroyed the lake. Lake Chad in Africa was number six lake in terms of size in the world, it's 90% gone. So there's no such thing as a body of water that's so large that we cannot destroy it if we um, try hard enough. So what? A, so that's my bad news, and I'll tell you some good news because you won't come back and hear me again if I keep talking about bad news. My husband says, "Do people knowingly come to hear you? <laughs> are they are they crazy?" The good news is that we're learning a lot about water. We're learning a lot collectively in a whole bunch of ways, and Ann Arbor is incredibly an incredibly important place for this learning um, to take place. We are learning about how we need to protect water, that one of the most important things that we can do is to keep water in watersheds, to protect water and to restore watersheds. And that means bringing water back where, uh, where, where it hasn't been. And, and a lesson for that is not to lose public control of it. Australia was allowing big agribusiness pumping out of the Murray Darling and massive amounts of water were leaving, was leaving the country in the form of virtual water trade, cotton, rice. Imagine growing rice in, in, uh, in Australia. Um, wine, the lovely Australian wines we all enjoy, all draining the Murray Darling to the point where the Murray Darling wasn't reaching the ocean anymore. Now, this flood's going to change things, but we'll see for how long. What they did was they privatized, they converted, I should say, the water licenses these big agribusiness companies had to water um, rights, to basic property. And the hope was that they would use them, make money on them, and therefore it would be to their advantage to um, not use so much water, because then they could sell their excess. That's not what they did. They started consolidating more, buying up water rights, and the, and the, the rate of water, the price of water went up from $2 uh, uh, um, make, I'm trying to think in liters and years, because we've switched in Canada. I grew up in one system anyway. $2 for their basic unit to $2,400 in, in a decade. It just absolutely 
exploded um, in terms of, of the price. Then these large international investors started coming in and now they're buying up the water rights. Not only do the farmers not own their water anymore, they're now working for international investment companies saying, well, we want to set up an almond farm here or whatever because we want to grow all the almonds in the world. So you're finding what's happening with this privatization of water is that there's big investment com companies coming in and kind of buying it up and saying, well, now we own it. Kind of like a chain kind of like Walmart owning, you know, all the, these Walmart's stores. Well, this is, these are investors owning private water uh, um, around the world. T. Boone Pickin, Pickens, you'd know him. He's a gazillionaire of some kind uh, from energy. He's buying up uh, lots and lots of water from the Ogallala Aquifer, and he's just holding on to it until it's worth even more money than it is now. I think he's in his late 80s. I'm not sure what he's waiting for, but anyway, good for him, I guess, if he's still making money on that. But he's privatizing water, and this is really, um, you know, this is the this is the step to losing um, local public control, and then the step away from being able to maintain control for watersheds. So what the Australian government's now doing is desperately trying to buy back the water rights that it gave them uh, two decades ago and having a terrible time because the price has risen and they can't afford it. So we must not lose control um, over these watersheds. We must consider them to be what some of us are calling a commons uh, a public trust and, and a, a protected bioregion. And there are a group of us who are coming together to um, make that very proposal for the Great Lakes. And uh, you know, I wanna, we're gonna come back to Ann Arbor and Detroit when we're more uh, organized to present to you a real plan um, to be part of something around the Great Lakes to eventually have a treaty that calls them a commons, a, a public trust, protected by public trust law and, and a, 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 a protected bioregion. But this is happening in many good stories around the world. I was in Bogota, uh, Colombia last year and had the honor of seeing one of the cleanup sites. The Bogota River is filthy, it runs right through the city. It provides their drinking water. And there's a project now supported internationally to clean up the Bogota River. And there are 16 sites that have been started. And I actually had the honor of seeing one of them. And you'd have thought, I mean, here I was in the middle of the city. You would have thought you were in the middle of the country. Acres and acres, acres of land has been restored. The animals have come back. The water's cleaning itself. Of course it will. Um, the birds have come back. The air is cleaner in these sites. Um, it was a real sense that, that uh, as Gerard Manley Hopkins, the great British poet, said there is a deep dearness down in nature and we just have to trust nature. So bringing it back, conservation, stormwater catchment, rainwater catchment, conservation, these are the cornerstones of, 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 of the need um, to understand the, the, the rights of water. And, and we're working, a number of us, on something called the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth. And this is a notion that outside of its use to us, you know, we're important, but not all, not all that important. Nature has fundamental rights. And it's very, very exciting to see this kind of ordinances, for instance, around the, the, the US. There are dozens and dozens of local communities saying, we don't want this company coming in here. Uh, bottled water companies in New England, uh, groups getting together in somebody's barn and saying, we don't want you in our, our community, and passing a local ordinance saying, this water is ours, or this wetland is ours. Um, in in, in uh, Pennsylvania, a group of people were trying to stop a landfill dumping. And so they declared the uh, land, this particular area of land, to be a legal person. They actually used the term, kind of competing with the Un uh, United States Supreme Court decision that corporations are legal persons. And they said that it, nature has rights. Ecuador has just passed an incredible law saying that nature has rights outside of its use to Ecuadorians, and all Ecuadorians have the official responsibility to take care of the natural world um, in and of itself and for itself. And if people and groups can even sue on behalf of a lake, or not just property owners, but actually a lake or a forest or a wetland. We have to work towards something called the public trust doctrine. Public trust doctrine has very deep roots in the United States, more than in my country, more than in others. And the notion really basically is that there are certain areas of life that are so important to us all because we depend on them that they should belong to us all, 
although they should be a managed commons, not a free-for-all, but they, that everyone should have access to them and nobody should be denied access because they cannot afford to pay and no one should be able to use them for private gain while others go without. Um, and there have been many exciting um, projects recently. Vermont was having trouble with its groundwater pumping because they had no protections for groundwater. They had a bunch of big bottled water companies coming in there and just pulling that water out of the ground. And a few years ago, and it was quite lovely, it was proposed by a state senator, Republican state senator and a Democratic state senator, both women, and they jointly proposed um, to make uh, Vermont's groundwater a public trust. And not only did they successfully do this, and it was unanimously agreed to in, in, uh, in the Vermont legislature, but they also said there's going to be a priority access to it, and they're going to give priority access to protecting the ecosystem, to um, uh, local sustainable food production, and to equitable access for, to water for health and life. Um, and so if you're a big company wanting to access it, you have to get a license and you have to take care of it or they have the right to take that license away. Recently, they've just introduced legislation in Maine that if there's a big bottled water company or a big water taking in a community coming in, the community has the right to vote yes or no about whether they want this. So this notion of the public trust uh, protecting our natural resources is something I think you're going to see um, grow. And then finally, there's the notion of water as a human right. It may seem like a motherhood to you to say fundamentally that water is a human right. How could it be otherwise? But it has not been considered a human right, either at the UN or in many constitutions, uh, and it's been a, a long-term struggle. Water was not put in the original 1948 Declaration of Human Rights because at the time they couldn't imagine that um, you would ever have a, a need to do this. Uh, but it's been clear for at least 20 years that we needed something to clearly identify that people should not have to watch their children die because they cannot afford to buy them clean water. And I've been working on this issue for 15, 16 years now, um, very intensively. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was invited to be the senior advisor on water to the 63rd president of the UN General Assembly. And we were sort of, you know, just skipped right into the very heart of the UN and, and put the case to them. Um, and last, um, June, Pablo Solon, who is the uh, ambassador from Bolivia, a little landlocked country in South Africa whose glaciers are melting because of climate change and who are terrified about the, the issue of water, decided they not, weren't going to wait anymore. The Human Rights Council was studying it, everybody was studying it, it was years away before we were going to have anything. And he just, one day at the General Assembly, he said, I'm putting a resolution in here, I'm tabling it water, human right to drinking water, and sanitation is a human right, yes or no. And the governments were all upset. My government was the worst. Yours was probably the second worst. Australia, New Zealand, and Great Britain were tied for the third place of worst. These five countries, the Anglo countries, got together and fought this tooth and nail, put in their own resolution, which was so wishy-washy that it was, you know, it was laughable. And then everybody said to Ambassador Sono, really, you should, you should take out sanitation because that's too strong. You'll never get sanitation. And then they said, well, you better say access to water because, of course, then if you have a private company offering it, then um, you can say, well, we did. We offered it just because they can't pay for it. It's not our fault. Pablo Sono said, no, this is the gold standard. I want to know, I don't even mind if I lose. I want people of the world to know which countries vote for and against this. So on July 28th, uh, this past summer, I was in the balcony with my staff and my husband who was pacing. I said, if you don't sit down, you've got to go outside. <laughs> Stop pacing, right? Uh, and we, we, they came to a vote. Uh, and what happens at the UN when it, in the General Assembly when it comes to a vote, they vote from their chairs and it goes up on a big electronic board. So you know real fast. It's not like you have to wait for hours. So Pablo Solon got up and he gave a deeply moving speech about what it meant to live without water and what it meant to watch his people dying from, from the lack of clean water. It was deeply moving. And uh, then they went to the vote and uh, 122 countries voted yes, 122 checks. I was standing, standing holding hands with my staff saying, we're not gonna win this, now don't, you know, to have gotten this far is very important, don't, but don't take, I was, you know, try, trying to bolster them for the loss, right? We didn't lose. 122 votes in favor, 
Not one country voted against and 41 abstained, including our two countries. But something you need to know, two months later, uh, the Human Rights Council, because of this wonderful move that uh, had taken place, finally uh, introduced their own resolution, uh, a very similar resolution on the right to water, which is based on some existing treaties, so it makes the General Assembly resolution even more binding. And, uh, and uh, the United States, which sits on the Human Rights Council, voted in favor of it. So this is a really big move, which you should have been able to read in your papers. And it was quite shocking that it was not carried or covered at all. It was a big step that the United States, between the July vote at the General Assembly and the October vote at the Human Rights Council, made this move. And I, I, I think it's um, exciting. And it's why I was so thrilled to think that we were talking about this on the um, connected to the Martin Luther King um, Symposium. So we need to take this now. We need to take it into our communities. And we have to say that people have the right to clean water. If you're living in a Great Lakes community that is so poisoned that you can't drink the water, you can't swim in it, you can't fish in it, you, you, you know, now we have these rights. Um, a place called Sarnia, uh, Ontario, which is uh, nicknamed Chemical Alley, the local First Nations community there, there are twice as many girls being born as boys because of the, the contaminants there. And uh, Canadian wildlife uh, experts have found um, similar abnormalities in, in uh, the fish and so on. So, I mean, we, we need to start thinking differently, that this isn't okay, it isn't okay to poison the water that we need for life and that we, uh, that we need for future, um, for the future. And we need to start thinking as first, the first peoples did of, of reverence, uh, corny as that may sound, reverence for this water. This water gives us life and we have, to, we, have to, we have to love it and care for it. And we have to think seven generations beyond our own. I'm gonna end the formal part of this with just two quotes that um, I love and wanna share with you. And then for those who wanna chat, I think we go into the, the room, the lecture room down to the, to the left. Um, the two quotes of this, one is by Carl Sagan. Oh, and just to say, please, if you're interested in knowing more about this, several websites to go to, Food and Water Watch here in the United States is a wonderful, wonderful organization. We're doing work on oceans, food, and fresh water. And Food and Water Watch has a big campaign to get a dedicated fund at the national level for infrastructure investment because our pipes in North America are disgusting and old in many cases. We need new infrastructure. Cash-strapped municipalities don't have the money, so they're turning to private companies. And those private companies, sure, they invest up front. And then after they've paid off their investment, then they make money for years and years and years and years and years from something that should be a fundamental public service. So a wonderful organization for you to work with. Um, but, but do go to our website in Canada, Council of Canadians, canadians.org, uh, and uh, follow us on this um, Great Lakes project. And because please, we really need to come together to declare the Great Lakes. We want to call it, or I'm talking about calling it, the Great Lakes Basins Commons. Great Lakes Basin Commons. So to think about it as our collective commons. And our dream is that maybe in two, maybe three years, that we actually have an action where we hold hands around the Great Lakes. And if we can't get enough of us, we'll just hands in the Great Lakes. <laughs> but, but that we symbolize that these Great Lakes are ours. I mean, couldn't you dream along about arriving at any boundary anywhere near the Great Lakes and seeing a sign saying, this, this is part of the Great Lakes. It is a protected bioregion. You must care for it. It doesn't mean that there isn't an economic role for it. It doesn't mean that companies can't use it can, doesn't mean that there won't be uh, fisheries and, 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 and all of the, the, the economic uh, industry, or some of it anyway, that we need, but it will, be, it will be ruled by the rule of law. Martin Luther King said, legislation may not change the heart, but it will restrain the heartless. We need the rule of law, and it's not good enough to save the Great Lakes right now. Where are, even where there are rules, we're not obeying them. They're a patchwork of inequitable, uneven rules. We need something greater than that, and we need to think about this thing outside the political boundaries and see the Great Lakes for the great gift that it is to us and, 
everyone who lives on it, and in fact, um, is one of the gifts to the world. And we, it's our job to protect it. We have to learn. Um, we have to, to 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 learn to care for it. It's it, what I call the right to care. We have to feel that we have the right to care and assert ourselves and be angry when somebody hurts um, these great lakes. So my quotes. The first is from Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan, as you know, is a late great. Um, scientist and environmentalist, and he said this. He said, anything else you are interested in is not going to happen if you cannot breathe the air and drink the water. Don't sit this one out, do something. You are by accident of fate alive at an absolutely critical moment in the history of the planet, which I think is gorgeous. The other quote is from Tolkien, and it's Gandalf. I loved this before the movies. I kind of got Tolkien on the mind because we held a, we did a tour of the tar sands in northern Alberta. And you need to read, if you don't know about the tar sands of northern Alberta, you should because it's all oil production, heavy oil production that's destroying a huge area. They've cut down a boreal forest the size of Greece. The water's being destroyed. The fish have three eyes. There's cancer rates among children in the local native communities. It's a terrible story. We've been fighting it really hard, and all of that oil go it's all destined for the US. And most of it, by the way, is now being sent by pipeline to refineries around the Great Lakes on the US side. So the acid rain issue is coming back. So I took a tour of it, and I took a bunch of people to see it, and we flew over it in a helicopter, and then we held a press conference, and I called it Canada's Mordor from Lord of the Rings. And there was really quite, it caught quite a stir. It was on the front page of all the papers, and, and, uh, and this energy executive said, which he shouldn't have, he said, it's not as bad as Mordor, and I thought, you shouldn't have given me an inch. You should have said, it's, there's no comparison to Mordor. Like, Mordor is the death of nature, right? To say, it's not as bad as total death of nature. We're saving a tree here and a duck there. No, he should, he should never have given me that, right? So anyway, I've Tolkien on the brain, but this is Gandalf. And Gandalf's facing that night when the terrible army's coming in and everything beautiful and nature and all that is good may be destroyed. And so he's talking about being a steward. So I just want to say, because I bet that you guys are stewards or you wouldn't be here, stewards of the Great Lakes, stewards of, of this gorgeous place. Thank you for saving it and that wonderful organ. Stewards of, of culture and, and the good values and um, that have built what we have, uh, all the good uh, that we uh, have come to be, um, and stewards of the notion that other generations have a right to this. So here's what Gandalf says, and I just want to thank you and end with this. He says, the rule of no realm is mine, but all worthy things that are in peril as the world now stands, those are my care. And for my part, I shall not wholly fail in my task if anything passes through this night that can still grow fair or bear fruit or flower again in the days to come. For I too am a steward. Did you not know? Thank you so much. <laughs>